if you have any miscellaneous questions, we can do miscellaneous questions for five minutes while we let people gather back. Go ahead. Oh, that's okay. I was just thinking about when you, you you sort of touched on leadership a little bit, which is always something that I always like to consider. I came from a generation where leadership meant telling other people what to do, <laughs> that, and that was sort of the size of it. And it's you know, and, and we've moved that needle some now, but it seems to me like the thing that's that is the most useful is when in you know difficult situations or dealing with difficult people is listening. That's obviously that's important but also really coming to <clears throat> enjoy what they're saying, to really celebrate what it is that they're saying, even when they're saying things that your mind's going, that you're, you're totally crazy. That doesn't make any sense. But really to come, you know, to come to a point where you really appreciate and enjoy the things that, <clears throat> that they're saying, because it's, it helps you understand the, the, the landscape that they come from. And I'd like to be able to do that more. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It's um. It, it's interesting to explore what that word leadership means, you know, and uh, how to how to lead it in a really humble way, that has that really deep listening capacity, like you're talking about. You know, that's it's in a way you're sort of saying, I'm leading because I happen to be here, but any one of us could be leading because we all have something to offer one another. You know, and we could all take turns being the leader of various roles, you know, and um, <clears throat> you're the leader of your area of expertise, someone else is the leader of theirs. And, you know, in the teachings on overcoming pride, they say it's very useful to think about how every single sentient being can do or knows something that you don't. Yeah, even the little ants, you know, they're able to carry however many more, more times their body weight, you know, we can't do that, you know, so th there's a way to kind of have that deep respect, genuinely, um, which makes you into that kind of deep listener where you're a leader just because it's the role that's useful for you in that moment, not because it's like inherently who you are or who you should be or something like that. You know, it's the, it's a a role you're choosing to adopt for a certain context that's useful, but you're happy to be flexible and adjust into another. Well, yeah, the transition to uh, sharing power has been is wonderful because it takes the pressure off. It's like, oh, you know, I need to be in control all the time. It's like, you know what, if you're not in control, your life's a lot happier. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and I think, I think for most of us, if there is an area in our life where we are the leader or a teacher or a facilitator and an area in our life where we're the student and we're the listener and we're the whatever. I think it's very useful to have a few different hats within your life and um, to be able to switch them flexibly. You know, it makes you less, I guess, grasp at the inherently existent title, you know. It's like, you're old compared to those who are younger, you're younger compared to those who are older, like everything exists within a context, so too leadership. And so if you're just in that really flexible mindset, then there's nothing to prove either. You know, it can be more relaxing. Yeah. So I think everybody's back. I think so. Um, are there are there some kind of thoughts to to I guess, dig into a little bit more deeply before we look more at the specific mind training verses. So the idea that Lo Zhang means thought transformation or mind training, Tonglen, giving and taking, which is kind of the practice of Lo Zhang. And that there are many, many texts that describe how to do this process of getting over self-cherishing by developing bodhicitta. Um, so I thought that we kind of unpack this idea of blessing because it's referenced in the verse that we are looking at. Um, even if the environment and beings are filled with fruits of negativity and unwished for sufferings pour down like rain, I seek your blessings to take these miserable conditions as a path by seeing them as causes to exhaust the results of my negative karma. So this concept of blessings, I think, is very useful to unpack, especially if, 
you're coming from a recovering, <laughs> I don't know, recovering Catholic, recovering fundamentalist Christian, recovering whatever sort of place, if your previous spiritual tradition was harsh in some way or tight in some way, or if you're coming from maybe a new age perspective, which maybe got a little bit like, I don't know, pixie dust sprinkles kind of an idea about blessings. Um, there, there's a lot of ways we can frame that word that might not actually be what a Buddhist means. And the meanings that other traditions bring to it might be totally beautiful and valid, but I think it's important to kind of unpack the words that have um, crossover meaning. So. Does anyone know what a blessing is in Buddhism? Have, have you heard your teachers talk about it? What is a blessing? <laughs> is it like being knighted, like you are now blessed? <laughs> or is it a little sprinkle? What is a blessing? It's interesting, isn't it? Because are we saying, please save me, please fix me, please change me? And who are we asking that of? That doesn't sound very Buddhist, right? And yet there it is in all of our prayers or most of our prayers, there's something about bless me to do this or bless me to do that. So we must mean something, hmm, right? It's, it's an interesting premise to kind of unpack. So. Blessing from a Buddhist perspective means that which transforms the mind. Yeah, George is saying gift waves of influence. Yeah, similar. Yeah, similar. It's, it's basically, you know, you've quote, received a blessing when your mind is changing in a positive way. What makes your mind change in a positive way then becomes the question. What is it that makes your heart open or makes something drop down from head to heart? What is it that makes you shift? What is a blessing? You know, a blessing is that which transforms the mind or when the mind is moving in a positive direction that it hadn't yet gone before. But what is it that makes that happen? You know, I think if we sit with it experientially, um, I, I like to use the example of um, probably someone in our life when we were a child said, treat others the way you would like to be treated, right? Maybe it was Mr. Rogers, I don't know, maybe it was your grandma, but treat others the way you would like to be treated. So you heard that. When did you actually believe it? When did you actually practice it? When was it that you took it to heart? And at what point did you live it? You know, when do those kind of transformations happen or those blessings happen or those, I don't know, cognitive shifts or developmental changes? When was it that something moved from something you heard, something you heard and understood, something you heard, understood and thought about to something you were? And it might be as simple as repetition, right? Just repetition, but repetition under the influence of a wisdom gaze right? Your own wisdom's gaze, your inner guru's gaze, because there's plenty of things that get repeated and then you just, you know, you kind of hold them as true, but they haven't sunk in because maybe part of you didn't really believe them. You just adopted the attitude that you did because it was, I don't know, socially acceptable. So from a Buddhist perspective, it's quote, merit that makes you have a realization or have a shift or for, for something to move from your head to your heart. But merit is really just mental momentum, right? It's just positive karma building up to a critical mass so that it can pop into a transitional phase. So it is repetition, but it's not just repetition. It's kind of a deep listening repetition that is hearing an old thing newly with whatever your experience has been. You know, so you hear, treat others the way you would like to be treated. And then you met someone who did that and you were inspired by the way they lived. And you thought, what a wonderful person to be around. And you thought of that thing again, married to this new experience you've had. And it sunk in a little more. And then you tried living that way as an experiment or as a curiosity or just to see what would happen. 
and you saw that when you treat others the way you would want to be treated, you're very relaxed, your heart is very open, and what's more, the people around you seem to enjoy it. Hmm, you know, and so then it's reinforcing, right? So et cetera, et cetera. But when we say, I seek your blessings, I seek your blessings, we're really saying to ourself, open up, open up, because the Buddhas are flooding us with altruism, with love, with compassion. They're flooding us all the time with everything they can possibly flood us with in terms of positive energy. The only limitation is our own mental barriers. So when we're saying I seek a blessing, we're saying, may I open up and become receptive to the beneficial energy that is already there. Does that make sense? Right? Or to the wisdom I already know, may I open up to what I already know to be true? It's like you're inviting what you want to be there. You're inviting the transformation and transition from head to heart. So, you know, I seek your blessings can start to feel a little bit like looking up, waiting for something. Yeah, when it's much more heart opening, allowing. Yeah. So whether you want to look at this in a, I would like whatever the expression of the divine is, whether it's Buddhism, Bodhisattvas or something else, I would like that to move my heart into a deeper and more open state or whether you're just asking that of yourself, you know, either way or both can be really useful. So anyway, so thoughts about blessings, thoughts about blessings, questions, arguments. I guess, you know, the point I'm trying to make with all of the thought transformation teachings is there is a place for asking for help. There is a place for feeling like you're being given something, but there's also a place for deciding and empowering yourself to make something a lesson and deciding to tell yourself what you already believe to be true. And the thought transformation teachings are very much that more proactive approach where whether you believe in external beneficial energy or not, whether you think that is all of humanity's beneficial energy or something like Buddhism bodhisattvas, what you're trying to do in your daily life way is have a deeper conversation with yourself that says, what is my life's actual priority? What is the world I want to see? What is my place in making that happen? Yeah, if I want to have an altruistic mind, if I want to have a kind heart, I need to address what blocks it. And I can address what blocks it through experience and through logic and through confronting the false logic that my self-cherishing has fed me with from beginningless time or what society has fed me through all forms of advertising however you want to frame it, right? So it's very useful to adopt this very proactive approach that says, I can make my spiritual practice just my conversation with myself. And I can listen for the fact that there is wisdom coming to me, whether intentionally or unintentionally, I will hear it if I'm listening for it. You know, so maybe a leaf fell down from a tree on your walk today and it reminded you of impermanence. The Buddha could have made the leaf fall or you could have decided that was something to remember or both, right? And if you live your life waiting for the Buddhas to send you something, it can get too specific. <laughs> They might be sending all sorts of lessons, sending all sorts of positive things. Who knows what they're up to, right? They're doing the best they can with our karma. But if we're sort of always waiting for divine intervention or we're waiting for a sign of divine favor, then we're just kind of walking around disempowered. Does it make sense? And, you know, there's, there's wisdom that has been taught already. You know, what are the Buddhas up to? They're up to sharing tools and techniques for, our, for us to transform our minds. So really, it's just read a verse, think about it deeply, try and live it, 
you know, it becomes a lot more straightforward and a lot less magic and yet works a lot more quickly. Arguments or additions? Yeah, Scott? No, no argument. I, it, it seems like that, that's sort of the point where you begin to tip over into spiritual bypassing. It, it, that, um, and, and that's, you know, it, it's common with my non-Buddhist friends that they sort of mistake the work that they're doing for, in their spiritual uh, practice, they're bypassing all of the things that they truly need to be dealing with, mostly their mental health issues and addiction, things like that. So yeah, that exactly. Feels like where that is, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, it, it's very, it's very useful to be inspired and uplifted by ideals that are greater than we're able to do right now. The danger is that we think, because I can't do it right now, I'm fatally flawed, and I can never, you know, or I have some sort of, I don't know, original sin or um, brokenness or something, we get into some sort of funny thinking that if it's amazing and wonderful, and I love it, but I can't do it, then I'm bad. Which is, you know, if we were talking just in terms of basic psychology is, you know, just a fixed mindset, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If we're in a growth mindset, then we're seeing everything as, oh, if I can't do it, I mustn't have learned it well enough yet. I mustn't have done it enough times yet. Not I'm bad, just it's new, <laughs> you know. Um, a fixed mindset says, if I can't do it, there's something wrong with me. A growth mindset says, if I can't do it, it's just too new. You know, it's a very different worldview. And that's just basic psychology, never mind Buddhism. You know, so, so what we want to do with these aspirations is let the aspirations build the energy for us to actually do the thing. You know, aspiration is not forcing it. It's getting yourself happy about it and excited about it in a healthy way. I so much want to live this way, you know? And if you so much want to live this way, you're going to have enthusiasm for seeking out antidotes to why you don't, you know? Okay, so we're going to switch gears and look at the eight verses of thought transformation, which are very familiar, I think, to a lot of you and maybe not to some of you, but um, they are useful and very cool. <laughs> so we're going to look at them. Okay. So they are by Geshe Langri Tampa, who was a great bodhisattva famous for his compassion and realizations. And these are this radical reframing that we've been talking about, Lo Jong, thought transformation. And they go in sequence of course to subtle, these verses. So by the end of the eight verses, we get into like hardcore mind training, but the first one is hard enough. So determined to obtain the greatest benef possible benefit from all sentient beings who are more precious than a wish fulfilling jewel, I shall hold them most dear at all times. Now this is Lama Zopa Rinpoche's translation and he says greatest possible benefit from, a lot of other translators choose to say for. The reason Lama Zopa Rinpoche says from is to try and more clearly target what the point of this verse is. Okay, so the target of this verse is to think about the fact that all of our spiritual transformation is relational. It's us related to other people, us related to other information, us related to stimuli of various types, and without others, we would not transform. Yeah, without others, both good and bad, there would not be transformation. No, it's not like you need others forevermore. You've had enough others. You know, you could go to your cave now if you had enough renunciation and bodhicitta and go to your cave and get good work done without interacting with any others. But the point is to think, all right, there's this mythical wish fulfilling jewel, you know, that Tibetan folklore talks about, which if you hold it and you wish, you'll get whatever you want. Sentient beings are more precious than that folklore or that mythical wish fulfilling jewel because they're what actually helps you achieve everything you need. What do you need? What do you want? Happiness, right? What's the cause for happiness? Positive beneficial actions, right? So how do you create positive beneficial actions unless there's something to interact with? 
Yeah. Who are you interacting with? Sentient beings. So seeing all sentient beings as a wish fulfilling jewel makes you careful with them. Yeah, it makes you careful with your relationships. It makes you really respect sentient beings very deeply. Maybe even especially the ones that are hard. If we were to think about the best qualities of ourself, our favorite things about ourself, right? Without getting cringy and, oh, no, I'm crap. No, just honestly, the things that we care about in ourself, our qualities, most of our best qualities were born from hardship, right? Most of them. And then, of course, reinforced by love and our resilience came from positive relationships and et cetera. But if we're to think about, you know, if you're able to cope with a lot of stress, probably you've already coped with a lot of stress, <laughs> right? It's not like you're magically able to cope with a lot of stress unless you built up to it through many other experiences and gradually got strong. This is so obvious and it's such common sense. And yet when we're in front of someone who is very difficult and challenging, we are not seeing them as a little gem. We're seeing them as an obstacle and we want them away. We want them to change. We want them to stop. We want them to go away. We're not thinking, oh, wish fulfilling jewel. Thank goodness this is building just the skill set that I was looking for. Tip of the hat, thank you very much. No, we don't think that. We say, go away, get out. So these verses are useful to sit with again and again because they become like slogans in your mind that just pop up and the next time you're thinking go away you also are thinking oh here's my chance yeah here's my chance to stretch into something deeper and wider and kinder yeah does it make sense so it's it's your radical reframing um but it, it is useful to think every single sentient being is helping me, even if they have absolutely no intention to help me at all. Yeah, they don't have to want to help me to be helpful. In fact, the ones that really don't want to help are the most helpful. Thanks, <laughs> right? So, you know, who's not helpful right now, but is actually very helpful? Hmm, <laughs> you know, we could read the news. Um, so it's, it's just kind of interesting to sit with the, the very thing that we don't want to happen is the very thing that will help us transform into what we want to be or to strengthen the skills that we already value. Um, this is straightforward. This we already know. Um, but then we get a little bit more hardcore as the verses go on and they get harder and also I think even more transformative. So the next one is and this can work very well with social media. When in the company of others, and I would add whether physically or online, I shall always consider myself the lowest of all and from the depths of my heart hold others dear and supreme. I shall always consider myself the lowest of all. Right, that sounds like a terrible idea, doesn't it? It's a terrible idea, right? You don't wanna be a martyr. You don't wanna be a doormat. You don't want people to walk all over you. What about assertiveness? What about speaking your truth, right? <laughs> so these are the thoughts that usually come up the first time you hear this verse. And a lot of you have heard it before. So you know that's not what's being said. But allow yourself to have that moment of, no, <laughs> I don't want to see myself as the lowest of all. I'm not the lowest of all. Humph. Or if you've been socialized female, perhaps you already think you're the lowest of all and you're like, I know, I am, okay, <laughs> right? Depending on how you've been socialized. So what's being said here is an invitation to a position of strength. And it's an invitation to get out of competitiveness, yeah? And it, this is also reflected in offering the victory to others verse. But what we're saying here is there can't be a fight if one person isn't fighting. There can't be a winner if one person's not trying to achieve that role, right? If you're the lowest of all, then everyone is safe with you. Do you know what I mean? Everyone is safe with you if you're adopting the attitude of I don't have to dominate this conversation. I don't have to dominate this space. I don't have to be the center of attention. 
I don't have to be right. And of course, you know, like Scott was mentioning earlier, and what a relief, right? And what a relief. But, you know, it, seeing yourself as the lowest of all is like, I don't know, kind of in a way being like Atlas with the world on your shoulders, able to hold it all, but without the suffering of Atlas. You know, it's, it's much more this position that says, I have allowed my heart to be big enough that I can support you. Yeah. So it's, it's again, this position of leadership slash service. Yeah, it's like you're the, you're the servant of all sentient beings because you're strong enough to be that. What makes you strong enough to be that is your bodhicitta. If you're coming at this from a position of, because I want everyone to like me, it's going to fail, right? If you're doing this because I don't want people to be mad at me, it's going to fail. Because those aren't bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is not wanting everyone to like you. Yeah, it can look like, oh, I'm the healthiest helper ever. I'm such a bodhisattva. I do nice things for people all day. Like, no, right? That is sugar-coated nonsense. But it's an easy trap to fall into. Thinking my, the purpose of my life is to be of benefit to all sentient beings. Does that mean feeding their afflictions and placating them? No. Sometimes it means sentient beings won't like you. And you're strong enough to say, that is their afflictions, that is not truth. They are not their afflictions, they have Buddha nature. I can speak to their Buddha nature and invite that out, invite that to come to fruition. If I'm not triggered by their afflictions landing on my ego, there's no fight. Yeah, there's only a fight if I let their afflictions land on something. What they're, what, the only thing they can land on is the false eye. It's not there. There is an eye, but not that one, right? Remember that the eye that exists is only that which is merely labeled by the mind on the aggregates. We superimpose this whole extra persona and the persona and facade need to be protected endlessly. And so it does not want to be the lowest of all, but it's very good for it if you can make it be. So questions on that one? That one can be a bit triggering. Yeah, I'll bring it up again, but just uh, go ahead and unmute yourself if you've got a question or addition about number two. I think the, the statement, <clears throat> lowest of all, is, you, is, can, can be a little bit triggering, as you, as you say. So it's low, lowest of all doesn't mean something negative about you. It, it's, it, sounds like you're saying something that you're it's something that you're <clears throat> that you don't have or something that's missing when in reality it's a, it is a strength and a positive thing and something that you that you should cherish and um and not consider yourself in some sort of negative light i guess yeah yeah exactly and i mean you can think of yourself as the lowest of all in the sense of the earth that supports everything on top of it you know, the earth is not, you know, destroyed by things being on top of it. You know, everything is of the earth anyway, in a way. It's, it's like you, you allow yourself to be expansive enough to carry more. You know, you feel oppressed when you're forced to be the lowest, right? But if you decide to be the lowest, that's a whole different feeling. You know, it's when you're making things voluntary, and that's kind of the essence of the logic of Tonglen, is when things become voluntary, the resistance is gone. When the resistance is gone, the suffering is less, you know? And seeing yourself as the lowest of all, it goes right up against what the ego is trying to do all day, every day, which is to be the best and be the one and be the thing, you know? There's there's a part of us that might think that we're the worst sentient being in the whole world. And there's a part of us that thinks we're the best sentient being in the whole world and the center sentient being in the whole world. And we don't often acknowledge that that's the case, but the ego or the self grasping ignorance, this mindset very much does think the world revolves around it, whether it likes to, or it doesn't like to, it's very centralized. And if you can kind of drop that positioning, it's a complete relief to you, but it also makes everyone feel a lot more space around them because you're one less person trying to energetically shove yourself forefront. 
Yeah, so you're removing yourself from the competition like this. Um, it's a little bit like, I don't know, if you're playing a board game with a little kid, you don't have to win, do you? And if they, if they win, you're kind of happy for them. Now, we don't want to be patronizing and think of people as little kids, but we can think of that mindset that the, the point of the game was not to win the game. The point was to have heart connection and interaction. You know, when you're playing a board game with a little kid, the point is about connecting with each other, isn't it? You don't care if you win or not, because the point is you're sharing time. Okay, so then the next one's really straightforward, if difficult, and that is vigilant the moment a delusion appears in my mind, endangering myself and others, I shall confront and avert it without delay. So when a delusion appears in my mind, meaning ignorance becomes more obvious and then boils into anger or boils into attachment, I'm gonna catch it before it hurts me and hurts others. There's a lot in here that is important because the moment a delusion appears in your mind is your best chance of overcoming it. That's your best chance. Once it gets ahead of steam, once it sinks in, once you believe it, once it becomes a mood in a whole mental atmosphere, it is much harder to shake yourself out of it, isn't it? You know, when you're in a like a mild irritation, and you say something to yourself about why it's not useful to be irritated or it's based on, I don't know, low blood sugar or something, you can kind of diffuse your irritation, mild irritation pretty quickly, right? If you catch it when it's just kind of a little bit of a, oh, I'm annoyed. But if you're in a mood, you know, in a mood, like invested, committed to a mood, like I am depressed today, like you're in it, can you just shake yourself out of it with logic? You can't. It's kind of got to run its course. You can just try and prevent damage while you're in that space and not, you know, say much to people <laughs> or write anything or do anything that's going to hurt anyone. You have to kind of, I don't know, behave as if you have a terrible contagious flu and you're trying to like quarantine a little bit and not make everyone else sick. Yeah. The moment a delusion appears in my mind, endangering myself and others, that's the moment where you can diffuse it. It can be dispelled and move on. Interesting, yes. True. True. Vigilant. Okay, so so that one, you know, it's it's obvious, but it's important. Um, I think sometimes we allow certain afflictions to make home in our mind because we think of them as kind of benign. And these are usually the more dangerous ones. If we're on a spiritual path, we probably know anger is not useful and we're trying to work on it. So when anger is arising, it's a project. But what about when attachment is arising? It's hard to see how it endangers oneself and others. Like take for example, I don't know, binging on junk food that you know is not healthy. That doesn't seem like it's hurting anyone, right? Binging on something that's not healthy for you, it doesn't seem to be hurting anyone. But if you allow it as a lifestyle habit, it does undermine your base level of health, which undermines your base level of energy, which makes you less beneficial to others, right? So you don't think of it as hurting others. You're like, I'm only hurting myself. But if you kind of allow it, then it's actually depriving the best of you from people. You know, like think about sometimes people get into the habit of watching TV at night and maybe they watch one half hour and it relaxes them and they go to bed. Okay, no worries. But it's really easy to get sucked into the vortex and like watch way more than you intended, stay up way too late and say to yourself, well, I'm only hurting myself. I'm staying up too late. I'm the one that's going to be tired. When in fact, the tired you is not the best you. And you're kind of, again, depriving others of the best of you. So what does it mean to harm oneself and others? The moment delusion appears in my mind, endangering myself and others, I will confront and avert it without delay. You have to kind of know what you get up to in there. A lot of what's damaging, we haven't even correctly labeled as damaging. You know, we've labeled, okay, my anger is a problem, I'm working on it. 
my attachment to this scenario or this person, I'm working on it. But there's a lot of habits that are driven by delusion that we haven't given the heading a delusion, but they are harming ourselves and others. So you just kind of like take a little very friendly, objective step back and gently ask yourself, what delusions do I indulge? Because I tell myself they're only hurting myself or I tell myself they're no big deal because they aren't a big deal, small and isolated by themselves, but they become a big deal because I do them all the time. You know, just like the least of the 10 non-virtues is idle speech or gossip, but it becomes one of the strongest because we do it so often, right? So just really, really gently, and you have to have the mind that understands that your afflictions and your behavior are not your fault. They're just your responsibility. You have to know that about yourself and about afflictions, that all of your habits, both good and bad, are learned, are contextual, are fed by countless causes and conditions. It is our job to work with them to make them as beneficial as possible, but we're not attributing fault or blame or a value judgment on ourselves for having them because anyone with our series of lifetimes would have wound up with the same series of habits, okay? So then you can be a little bit more pointed in your examination of your own habits without it feeling like this weapon of self-harm. Do you know what I mean? So pointedly say, okay, yes, that's a thing I do. It's not useful. It endangers myself and others, but that doesn't make me bad, right? It's just not skillful. I'm going to work on it. You know, gentle thoughts. Yeah. So be really nice to yourself when you do this examination. Okay. Yeah. Petra, did you have something? I, I just have a very basic question, so I'm, I'm apologizing in advance, but I, I, I come from a psychological um, background, so I, I get confused with the word delusions, Yeah. Um, and, and so I just don't know how to, to hear it uh, within a Buddhist perspective. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's good. It, it's, there, those yeah. two words aren't there that um, there's overlap in Buddhism and psychology, delusion and yeah. attachment. And they mean very different things in Buddhism than they mean in psychology, mm -hmm. right? So in psychology, delusion is, you know, really not in touch with reality at all, right? You know, you're just completely out to sea, out with the fairies. In Buddhism, delusion means that in a much more ordinary way, because we all have delusions because we believe that things are inherently existent because they appear so, when in fact everything is empty of inherent existence. So based on that fundamental misunderstanding, then we get attached, then we have anger, then we have all the other negative states of mind. So deluded ignorance, yeah. So it's basically, it's, it's talking about that fundamental misunderstanding. Yeah, as opposed to like hallucinating. I mean, in a way we are, we're hallucinating inherent existence. And then, you know, and then attachment, of course, in psychology can be something quite positive. And in Buddhism, we're talking about thinking that what is good is good from its own side, divorced from context. We're thinking that the good is good in isolation from the bad. We're thinking that the good is the source of happiness. So in, a so in Buddhism, attachment always means an exaggeration, a misunderstanding. So that's, yeah, those are tricky and we need, I wish we had more words in English. Yeah. So anyway, so those are just some mind training things to play with. And um, next week we'll do a few more and we'll look at some different texts that talk about similar things. But um, I thought to dedicate, we would use um, uh, Shanti Deva's Guide to a Bodhisattva's Way of Life in the dedication chapter. There's a really beautiful prayer, some of you know. So I thought we'd just read that again. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food, 
May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the misery of the world. Okay, thanks everyone.